What a blessing it is to be on this journey together through the letter of Ephesians, and it's my privilege to continue to walk us through. Today we look to finish chapter 2 as I'll be preaching verse 21 and 22. If you'll grab your Bibles and turn with me to the letter of Ephesians found in the New Testament towards the back of your Bibles there. As you do, I'll recap that last week we focused on the foundation that we, the church, are built on. Ephesians 2.20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And this week, we finish chapter 2 by focusing on the structure that is built on that foundation. Look with me at our verses today, verse 21 and 22. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Lots to cover this morning as we finish chapter 2. I'm excited for what God has prepared for us as I've spent many hours this week in study and prayer with him and uh, excited to, to share these good things with you this morning. Um, look with me as we dive in now to verse 21 and 22. In these two verses, Paul essentially says the same thing. That essentially we, the church, are being joined, are growing, are being built into a holy temple, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Look again, Ephesians 2, 21. In whom the whole structure being built being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Then verse 22, In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In whom and in Him, both start the beginning of both verses. To look at these beautiful truths Paul is giving us here in verse 21 and 22, we need to start where he started, which is really the emphasis of last week's sermon in verse 20 which is that the church is vitally connected to Christ as the sure foundation, as our essential cornerstone. Church, we only have spiritual life and progress in life that honors God because of Christ. And if we are grounded in Christ then God will do His work in and through us. This is why Paul is so careful and purposeful to say that any growing, any building, any unity we have in the church, we have in Christ. Understand, as we begin to look at the structure that God's building, the church itself, we are in Christ And we're not just built on Christ. Meaning it it wasn't Christ back then who did something and now he's gone. And then it's us doing something now. But our very spiritual lives and progress is essentially and dependently connected to Christ. Every day. Scripture is clear time and time again that it is Christ in us and us in Christ. To get outside of this understanding is to grab hold of another view of, of, of religion or, or something that is, is, is a, a moral instruction for conformity. No, it is Christ at work and, and Christ at work in and through us. We're dependent on Him if we're not attached to Christ as the cornerstone, not fixed rightly in the cornerstone, then we are not a part of His temple. We won't rightly grow and and go about the days He's called us to. It begins and it continues in Christ. Just as if we're not connected to the head, the head who is Christ, then the body of Christ 
is not. We must, it, to be the body, we must be connected to the head. If we're not grafted into the vine, who is Christ, then we are dead branches, unable to produce anything spiritually good or God-honoring. Go back and remember Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Our focus on the atonement, which, which by God's blessing fell at the time of, of Holy Week this, this year of 2020, focusing on that last week of Christ, His death on the cross in our place. Church, for those who are in Christ, we're no longer far off. No longer excluded from God's people. No longer blind to His truths. No longer separated from Him. We have been brought near to each other and to God. We've been brought in, adopted, reconciled, redeemed to God's family because of the blood of Jesus. The death of Jesus in our place. The propitiation of Jesus to appease God's righteous wrath due our sin. We are now in Christ Jesus. This is, again, Paul's one of his most important points in this entire letter. We miss one of the great emphasis of the letter of Ephesians to not constantly see God's ordained emphasis in Paul's writing in this point. So I want to, I want to continue to help us see it as it shows up. And so let's just quickly again run through chapter 1, chapter 2. In Ephesians 1, 1, Paul is writing to the saved saints who are in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 1, 3, Paul emphasized that we are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. In Ephesians 1, 4, the elect are chosen in Him, in Christ, from eternity past, that is before creation. In Ephesians 1.5, we are predestined for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 1.7, we're redeemed in Him. In Ephesians 1.11, we have obtained an inheritance in Him. In Ephesians 1.13, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit in Him. In Ephesians 2.5, again he says we're saved, we're made spiritually alive with Christ. Ephesians 2.6, we see that we're raised up and seated with Him in the heavenly places. In Ephesians 2.7, we know that the immeasurable riches of God's grace is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Ephesians 2.13, in Christ Jesus, we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And then again today, verse 21, 22, there's no denying that all of these greatest gifts, all of this most vital change in our identity and position in eternity is absolutely dependent on our union with Christ. To be saved, we need all of Christ's righteousness and we need none of what we are in our sin. Christ alone perfectly and completely satisfies God's holy standard for us. I want each of us to see how absolutely dependent and completely united with Christ you are to see just how life-altering this news is to be saved in Him, to be grafted in and connected to Christ. As you remember last week, we looked at Acts chapter 4, 11, and 12. Let me remind you of, the, of these few verses. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let me ask you today, where are you with Christ? Not where are you with religion, with the church, with your own perception of how you might be okay with God or not. Jesus is life, new life, spiritual life, salvation, or He is an obstacle, a tripping point contention is Jesus an 
obstacle in your life? Is he someone that must be dealt with? A religious hurdle to overcome? Church, Jesus must be more to us than a box to check. It might be easy on Sunday morning as we gather to worship and we're, 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 we're headlong into the Word of God to, to be like, of course Jesus is more than a box to check, but what about Monday at 10.30 and Wednesday at 2.30 and Thursday at 9.30? Have you moved past Christ? Is Christ on the shelf? Or is who you are and what you do in Christ Are His ways your ways? Are, are His commands your joy to obey? Or are you constantly going, I don't know if I want to do it that way, His way. Jesus must be to you your foundation to all of life. A rock in which you stand and trust in Him. Even when you don't understand the circumstances, even when the storm is raging, He is a cornerstone that keeps all that you are together and whole and pointed in the right direction. Is He the one, Jesus, the one your whole life is built in? Without Him, you have nothing. church may we continue to solidify how we are always and fully connected to christ and without him we have nothing that is good for life with god especially life with god in eternity everything and anything that you do that honors god that is good for anything true and lasting is absolutely dependent on christ you might be saying pastor you spent all the last week telling us this and now all of this opening sermon, we're only two words in. Yes. And, and we need it again and again and again. This is why Paul says it again and again and again in almost every verse that we've studied yet far to this point. Any part of us that, that wants to move on is the part of us that doesn't get it. Jesus is clear that apart from Him, we can do nothing John chapter 15, verse 5. He is the foundation. He is the cornerstone. We are built into Him. This is Paul's next emphasis. Look with me. Verse 21. In whom the whole structure being joined together. In Christ, the whole structure being joined together. And then verse 22. In Him, in Christ, you also are being built together. The imagery Paul uses here for the church is one of a structure, a building. More specifically, a holy temple. We're going to finish with that emphasis. We'll come back to the emphasis on the holy temple. The emphasis I want to focus on in this point is the fact that we are many who are being joined together into one. We are we who are the true believers in Christ are, are mortared together with Christ as God the architect builds his church. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2 5. You yourselves, speaking of the church, are like living stones, are, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter here refers to us as living stones, purposefully, strategically placed by God into a spiritual house. We are chosen and shaped for our position in that structure of God. We're like pieces of broken glass in our sin that God has redeemed 
and now uses to make the most beautiful mosaic that is the Holy Church. While the structure is us, understand that it is His to determine, His to shape, His to grow. What the church looks like or how it functions or the role that each of us plays is not up to us. It's up to Him. We belong to Him. And this is why any language that we might in our sin fall into or we become complacent or complaining about how the church isn't the way we want it to be is, is moments in our, that our flesh is lived out. It's not about what I want. It's about what He wants. I belong to Him. I'm here to be used how I can be best used. That, that, I, I, I give that away. I don't declare it has to be like this. I have to have this. I, it has to be this. No, it's not about that. It's His to mold and to build. Psalm 127, verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. It's those moments in our hearts where we want it to look like the way we want it to look. Or what's good for us. Or, or maybe trying to connect it to a past experience that we like or that we long for. Any of that building, any of that self-motivated building is in vain. The Lord builds the house. Sadly, many people in our modern day are are guilty of building church ministries that are essentially man-made, man-driven entities cloaked with Scripture and songs about God and speak about salvation and baptism, but they're they're man-created, man-upheld, man-driven. There was an era in the church where the most popular kind of book was, was business model building books. I had, I had shelves of them from decades past as, we, as the church navigated through that system. Went to a conference. You come home with a box full of books written by business-minded people, business-minded pastors using man-made ideas and structures and formats to build the church. And all this produces is superficial, shallow growth. Yeah, it might produce a lot of numbers, but it's shallow. It doesn't cause one to be truly grounded in Christ and trusting in Him completely and dead to self to live to Him, to be used however He would ordain. God saves many and has done this despite these man-made efforts. He's done marvelous things despite many of mankind's short-sighted efforts to build the church. But in the end, according to Scripture, it must be Him who builds. It must be His way. It must be His timing. This has been our humble effort of the last decade plus to, to lay down the things we were good at, the things that we had had done to produce numbers and growth and, and just to get back to the basics of looking to Scripture and letting God shape who we are to be, to stay focused on God's priorities and trust His building of the church. And, and I say praise God. Praise God for what He's doing. One of my favorite things to share is is the testimony of some of our long-standing members, members who have lived through the different eras of our growth, of our success, of our our being the it church in all of Kern County, members who have been with us 60, 70-plus years. And what's so sweet is to have some of them say, it's never been healthier, it's never been better than it is right now. And what's so wonderful about that is that has so little to do with our Form and function, the man-made stuff, has everything to do with what God is doing as we've gotten out of the way. Praise be to God. May it be so for generations to come. Unless the Lord builds the house, 
those who build it labor in vain. The building of the house that is the church is a work that began long ago and will continue until the last person of God's elect is saved and Christ returns to install the new heavens and the new earth where we will dwell with Him forever. I want us to realize, go here with me for a moment. You who are saved, you've trusted in Jesus, you belong to Him. This is the most impressive, most magnificent, most exciting thing in your life to be part of. God's church. His house. His kingdom. It is bigger than what your company is doing or accomplishing. It's bigger than what your sports team is doing or accomplishing. It's bigger than what your kids are doing or accomplishing. It is the work of God to build His kingdom. And we get to be part of that. Do do you see it? Do, Do you realize personally God is doing this every day in many ways we don't even see. There is a, a silent, quiet, holy construction that is the true church being built. Why is it like that? Because the church is built in the hearts of man. God who gives saving faith and sanctification that changes people from the inside out, that brings unity to what was disjointed and dis, full of discord among people, brings us together in unity. See with me the work of God to build this house. Consider with me this unique detail found in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. It's the holy temples being built. The verse says this, When the house was built, it was with stone prepared at the quarry so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built. When the holy temple was being built, it was was this uniquely silent, quiet thing. There was this holy reverence. No other temple in history has been built this way. And with great reverence and awe, one by one, the stones that were prepared elsewhere were placed, and the structure grew into a beautiful temple to honor the Lord. But isn't this how He grows us today? Building His church today? Day by day, hour by hour, God moves in dead hearts to wake them to life and add another living stone to His eternal, holy temple. We are being built to honor the Lord both now and forever. What is more amazing or more important in your life than that? What? Nothing you're working towards. Nothing you're doing, nothing you're dreaming of will ever be as significant as your being a part of the holy, eternal house of God. The kingdom of God. Now notice another layer of emphasis that Paul gives us here. He says that we are together. Look with me in our verses. Verse 21 in Christ, in whom the whole structure being joined together. Verse 22, in Him you also are being built together. Beloved, we must treasure the unity we have in the church, for it is unlike any other unity we will know in this life. It is greater and truer than any unity we might manufacture on our own. We are a united force, a body of believers, a holy structure, sound fixed in the cornerstone, 
And we belong to each other, united in Christ for the glory of God. The only thing that comes close to this kind of unity is what God has ordained for a man and a woman who are separate individuals to become one in marriage. The mystery and the magnificent reality of God's design to make two into one in marriage is like nothing else. But it points to the union that the church has in Christ. We, the church, are united together in Christ. Even that mystery, the beautiful, unlike anything else, bond of marriage points to this. Brother, sister, in Christ, you you have to stop seeing your faith journey and your God-assigned days on earth as an individual thing. You are united as one in Christ. We are bound together in Christ as the church. When you celebrate, we celebrate. When you mourn, we mourn. When you fight sin, it affects us. It is only our flesh. It is only the old playbook that causes us to throw a fit and say, hey, I'm not getting things the way I want them to be or I'm feeling a little left out. It's, it's the deception of the enemy in our ear to combat the reality of who we are as the church in Christ. May we stay fixed on the truths of God and let them override the fleshly feelings that cause us to be disconnected or to create distrust with each other. Whether we like it or not. Because in our flesh, there's moments where we don't. There's moments when we want to complain. There's moments when people get on our nerves. But that's our flesh. That's sin. Our unity in Christ is our reality. And it's a beautiful one to be celebrated, to be cherished. The diversity of who we are is part of the beauty of it. Consider the words of Paul to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Do you see the diverse unity? As in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. We're different. We look different. We talk different. We like different things. We, we've come up with different upbringings. We have different preferences and styles and, and things we do and things we're good at and things we cherish. We're very different. Very diverse. But verse 5, though many, we are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. We're united This diverse unity is the testimony of the church. It, it doesn't say you've got to look just like us, talk just like us, think just like us. There is a diversity, but the diversity finds its unity in Christ. Where we cherish the unity to the point where we don't let the things that make us different override the fact that He is that bond within us that we cherish, that we cling to each other, we hold up each other, we fight for each other. Beloved, we're members of one another. Look at our passage again, verse 21. In whom the whole structure being joined together. Verse 22. In him you also are being built together. We're joined together, we're being built together. Unity is not a side note. It's not something we understand and then move on. It's something we must slow down, grab hold of, live out. Why? Because it is a major part of our testimony to the watching world. 
for this purpose time that God has for us here on earth. We know this because it is a major part of Jesus' final prayer to the Father before He's arrested and goes to the cross on our behalf. What was He praying for in that final hour, in that final time, that that intimate time with the Father, that high priestly prayer? What's What's His final plea to God the Father? It's for our unity. The high priestly prayer, John 17. Look at verse 9 through 12. I'm praying for them. I'm not, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name and which you have given me. I've guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. <clears throat> Did you hear it? That they may be one even as we are are one. Only in Christ are we empowered to have this unity. Gospel-driven, God-honoring, patient, humble, loving unity. We cannot, we will not know this kind of unity without Christ in us. And when it breaks down, so does our testimony. Church, we must be united. We must be together. In Christ. Together in purpose. Disciples Church exists to glorify God through lives that are being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our purpose. It's not my purpose. It's not the elders or staff's purpose. It's our purpose. To glorify God as lives are being transformed, disciples being made by the power of the gospel, by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to be united in that purpose or we're going different directions. Focused. Together. We also need to be together in doctrine. We will only do this to have unity in doctrine if we let Scripture guide us. If we submit to Scripture, if we're willing to stand on what Scripture is teaching us and, and, that, and that united cling of, of, of our brothers and sisters for history before us. One of the ways we've identified how we can do this with with very specific unity is is through our statement of faith, our, our, our statement of beliefs found on our website. Website. Every member of our church agrees to be united in our beliefs and what Scripture teaches. This is so important, church. Our confession, guiding us, shaping us, holding us accountable, that we would not veer left or right. Listen to Paul's plea with the church in Corinth when it comes to unity and core doctrine. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind And same judgment. See that this is something we take very seriously here at Disciples Church. We see it biblically as a very central component of our unity. In our members class, we spend time emphasizing these things. So that each person who agrees to covenant with us 
is of clear understanding. In our preaching of God's Word every Sunday, in our study and work through the Word of Truth Catechism at midweek, we aim to solidify these biblical understandings in doctrine for our unity, for our testimony. Our high goal is to rightly divide God, divide God's holy word so that we are together to stand on solid biblical doctrine. This is a major part of our unity and therefore what God is doing in and through us, the local church. Now notice with me one particular emphasis we see in verse 21. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The church joined together in Christ is growing. How is it growing? Well, it's growing in number as more of God's elect are saved and brought into the fold, adopted, grafted in, living stones added to the structure. Each of the elect are being added to the flock. We are also, in addition to being growing in number, we are growing spiritually. When we're saved, while we are sanctified in a way that gains us access to God the Father through Christ and because of His perfect righteousness, we individually are a long way from mature, perfect, and lacking nothing. This is why the Christian life is one of ongoing progressive sanctification. Sanctification is to be made holy. It's a refining process. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. God is sanctifying us transforming us in the work of the Spirit. This is why we study God's Word. This is why we lean into God in regular prayer. This is why we have shepherds to lead us and teach us God's Word. Why we have the body of Christ, the church, to walk with us, to hold us accountable, to help us grow and not veer away. But most essentially... I want you to see how the church is growing spiritually as we are fixed in Christ. Or as Jesus himself taught, abiding in him. Look again at Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. The word we see most often used by Christ in John 15 is this word, abide. It's the first thing I... I want us to realize is that abiding is always in reference to divine fellowship. Only those who have been born again are capable of having fellowship with the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. To be in Christ is to abide in Him. There's two different ways that that happens. We must first be in Christ if we're going to abide in Christ. Believers are, are, ne, are not exhorted to be in Christ. Being in Christ is the work of the Lord. But we are exhorted to abide. The, the word abide means to continue, to dwell, to remain, to fix. It's really where our attention, our priority is going. To abide, to stay plugged into the source of life, which is Christ Himself. We do not thrive in the Christian life by getting distracted, by dwelling or being fixed on other things. It's in these seasons that we drift, that we wander, that we, that we slip into sin. and No, we must see and savor our, our Jesus instead. 
and stay fixed on him. To abide is to remain constantly in Christ, pondering his word, acting for his glory and will, living out who he is in us. We're always desperate for him. And there's a progression, even in this passage. Jesus moves in eight different references of talking about the fruit. To talk about fruit, and then more fruit, and then much fruit. Revealing some of the progression of our sanctification. When the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Scriptures talk about fruit, it's always talking about character. It's not just an outer result of good looks, great voice, one who can run fast. No, it's the growth of the blessing that comes from the core of who we are. The characteristics of a person, what we put forth, and blessing others, and how we navigate this life. The fruit or the character of the Spirit of God at work in us. It is growing in Christ-likeness. Evidence of maturity in God and a life that honors Him. It is the growing that God does in and through us. Think of the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. The work that God's doing in and through us to change us and sanctify us. And so we as Christians, we don't focus on trying to be better people, trying to be more happy or joyful or self-controlled. That's an external modification. No, we need to abide in Christ and the Spirit. Spirit produces this change in us. This is the growing that's happening in Christ. He is the vine. We, the church, are the branches. Plural. Together we're growing into Christ and He's growing the fruit of the Spirit in us. This is what makes us a holy temple. The perfect work of Christ, the ongoing, and then the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the structure he's building us into. Verse 21. In whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What kind of structure is God building as He saves and adopts each member of His eternal family? It's a dwelling place for God. It's it's where the King reigns. I mean, think about that, church. It's the holy temple in the Lord. Scripture spends so much time focusing on this imagery of the temple. Now, I want to take a little bit of time this morning to, to consider some of the places of reference that we see this used and, and God's ultimate purpose for it. Um, the, the type and the anti-type as we see unfolding. As we go back to the Old Testament, we see that God dwelt among His Old Covenant people via the tabernacle and then the temple. It was God's dwelling place among man. It was there in the midst of Israel's camp, God who is spirit took up his residence among the people. There between the cherubim on the mercy seat, he made his throne in the holy of holies. He manifested his presence by means of his Shekinah glory. The temple was where the Ark of the Covenant was housed. It was the most important part of the mercy seat where the priest spread the blood, the pure spotless land to make atonement for the sins of the people. This is why the, the people came to the temple at Passover. The temple meant so much to the people. Why? Because it is where God resided among men in the Holy of Holies. Dwelling place of the Lord among men. 
Now fast forward with me to Jesus' day, God in flesh. John chapter 2, 18 through 21. The Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will rise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. There they are, in the midst of the temple. The temple has been the dwelling place of God in the Old Covenant. Jews understood this, but a truer and better temple had come. It is Jesus himself, God in flesh. How much more God has made manifest that we see and savor him in the person of Christ. The word becomes flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.14, the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt here means tabernacled to tent or encamp, to occupy, to reside, as God did in the tabernacle of old. For those 33 years that Jesus tabernacled among man, God made His dwelling place in Palestine, in this truer and better temple that is in Christ Himself. The Holy of Holies receives its antitypical fulfillment in the person of Jesus, God the Son. Just as the Shekinah glory dwelt between the two cherubim, so on the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory of the God-man flashed forth between Moses and Elijah. And they said, we we beheld His glory. It's the language of the temple, language of the tabernacle. Further, the temple was a way to reveal the holiness and the character of God. And how much better do we see this in the person of Jesus? Who will later say in John 14, 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So in the presence of the temple... And in the wake of clearing the temple courts, the merchants, Jesus is going to refer to himself as the temple. Saying, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Why? Because it is his death on the cross that will be the final atonement for his people. Because he will not remain dead, but will rise in three days, and thereby be the firstborn of all who would receive new birth in Christ and restored to God forever. This is the gracious and costly, sacrificial, willing act of Jesus for His people. So what does Jesus mean when He says, destroy this temple in three days I will raise it up? The Jewish listeners were thinking of the building, the temple, that took 46 years to construct. They're thinking, you're going to tear this thing down and three days be this, this incredible construction man and rebuild this thing? No. On, on the most, in the most amazing way, he, He's giving them a sign of this most amazing miracle, the resurrection of Christ. He's talking about something all of human history has needed and been waiting for. Greater than a building. A centerpiece for the Jewish faith. That was a placeholder. Something far greater and amazing of a miracle than even what Quick construction would look like. The resurrection of what is dead to life. The temple of His body would be torn apart. He would bear the sins, past, present, future of all of His people, worldwide people, and conquer death and defeat it and finish it and then rise. Jesus is saying, I will do this. You remember what he said in John 10, 17 through 18, when he said, I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. 
He lays down his life for our sin. And he takes it up again in victory. When they destroy it by his permission and will of the Father, he builds it up again in three days. Praise be to God. Matthew 12, 6. He says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. He's talking about himself. Jesus, the temple. I'm the new temple. When I raise my body from the dead, my chosen people from around the world will come to God through me. There will be no more need for pilgrimages to Jerusalem, to that building. There will be rebirth in the heart and living faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation and life with God. When Jesus died, the testimony in Matthew 27, 51 says, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil of the temple is ripped from top to bottom and the Holy of Holies is exposed. Why is this important? Because we need to see that the old covenant and the whole sacrificial system had come to an end. The Holy of Holies is exposed. How is that appropriate? How is that okay? It's not set apart anymore. It's not protected. It's not, it's not kept holy. Why? Because it's no longer the dwelling place of God among His people. Christ, our mediator, our redeemer, intercedes for us before God directly. So now let's bridge. Let's take the important step that Paul takes here in our passage. Built on all this understanding. If Jesus is the temple, then how are we, the church, the temple? Right? In whom the whole structure is being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. He's the foundation. We're the structure. How is he the temple? And yet it says we're the temple. Think about it. We who are the bride of Christ, the church, are the body of Christ. And he is the head. Christ is the foundation, and we are the structure. It comes back to the thing that we must not ever do, which is to separate ourselves from Christ. We, the church, who are in Christ, are the temple. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 3, 16-17, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Church, we are the body of Christ. We are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, Scripture says. With emphasis to what we do with our lives, Paul brings correction, rebuke, and teaching to the Corinthian church in, in chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is Paul's emphasis in verse 22. Ephesians 2.22, In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I want you to see today. I want you to know that you do not need to make a pilgrimage to a temple. The house of the Lord is not this building. We need to stop calling it that. The structure, the walls of this place are not the house of the Lord. That's Old Covenant language. 
We, the united church, are the house of the Lord. The presence of the Lord has come near. He lives within the hearts of His people. We, the church, are the holy temple. We are the united, redeemed people of God. We are the house of God. Catch this important clarity in my words. We, the united, redeemed people of God, are the house of God. You as an individual are not the church. No, the united, redeemed people of God are the church. This is why you're not doing church right now as you sit at home and worship through these means. This is a compromise in a very unique time. But understand, it is a compromise. The church is the gathering. It is the accountability. It is the discipleship. It is the following of the shepherds. It is the redeemed individuals who are united together. As this building, just like all the old temples, are no longer the house of God. You don't have to come to the building to interact with God. We together are the house of God. This is a potent and powerful insight into who we the redeemed have become in Christ. Consider with me what this meant for those in Ephesus who are reading this letter under the shadow of the most massive temple, world-famous Temple Diana. If you remember, Ephesus was most known for the Temple Diana, also called the Temple of Artemis, based on Greek mythology. The Temple of Artemis was later deemed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world because it was so massive and so grand. It was central to that community. That local economy was largely driven by the the merchants of temple trinkets and tourist activity to this structure, this structure of false worship. So here's the proclamation of Paul to both Jew and Gentile who are being united into one structure, a holy temple that was for the dwelling of God. This would have been, when understand rightly, a truly game-changing revelation for the believers in Ephesus. Because everything about Their lives and livelihood and culture was connected to this temple of Diana. And now God has supernaturally done something in them because of Christ to make them the dwelling place of the true and living God. To make them into a holy temple, Jew and Gentile united together. They've spent their entire lives under the shadow of the temple of Diana And much of their livelihood centered on it. Now Paul says they themselves are made new in Christ. A dwelling place for the almighty God himself. A holy temple in the Lord. Disciples Church, I want you to see for us that we don't miss what this means for us. How game changing this should be for us. In Christ, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Verse 21. Verse 22. In Christ you you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This news needs to capture us. It needs to send us forward in life and in faith in a way that that changes everything. So, So that you don't just finish the service this morning and go back to normal. No, may God's Word and the teaching of the Word and the revelation of clarity the Word brings to us shape us, change us, motivate us, wreck us to see 
the grandeur, the power, the beauty of what He's doing in the church for His glory. We who are the church are to be what God's called us to be. And to do this and to be this is no small matter that lives in the shadows of our man-made ventures or priorities. It is the priority of God to build His kingdom. The only everlasting kingdom. Everything else will burn. Everything else is momentary. Even the greatest temples of human history all have or will have their demise. But the temple of the Lord will stand forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your good and holy Word, the instruction, the revelation that You bring through it, perseverance of it, our access to it, that, that it gets to shape us and mold us and, and and convict us and, and mobilize us, Lord. You, I just thank you. I praise you. I praise you for working through Paul in all the ways that you have, writing much in the New Testament, specifically this letter of Ephesians. I thank you for the blessing it's been in these last 27 weeks to be studying and growing through our understanding of your Holy Word in chapter 1 and chapter 2. We, we look forward to what's ahead now in chapter 3. But Lord God, I pray that none of this is, is a box checked, is church done, what's for lunch, moving on. But God, that these truths are, are shaping, are moving, are, 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 are giving us a different way of looking at our days, our relationships, our testimony, the way we, we hold so high the work of what it means to be the church and to, and to do the work of the church as our great priority. And so we, we just say thank you. We, thank you. we say thank you, Lord, for your endurance in us in this very unique time that has affected the world. And, and we are just on our, our, our tippy toes, just, just ready to, to go forward and, 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 and to be together and to be in each other's lives and, 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 and to, to do the work of the church, to be what this united testimony and, 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 and work and worship is meant to be. And, and yet, in the midst of plans interrupted and, and society turned on its head, we, just, we trust you. We, we trust you in this moment. Just as a, a, a city wrecked by a hurricane or, 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 or an earthquake or, or by, by the uh, just tidal wave of, of war, ravaged by war God th these things that they happen and and we just we walk by faith because you're over it all you're at work in it all and yet we long to be to die to ourselves and to live to Christ because the glory is for Christ we don't want the glory we don't want to be about us I'm sorry Lord for all the ways we've made it about us let it not be about us even in the portrayal of our longing to a watching world, but let them not see that we're undone because it's not going the way we want it to go. No, let them see that our hope is in You, that we're fixed in our peace and our joy in Christ. And so we walk by faith, and we, and we live for Your glory. Let us, not, let us not attempt to put our hands on the wheel to build. You are the builder. We are your people, your beautiful mosaic for your glory. All glory be to Christ. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray.